Hello everyone, welcome to the course Basic Cognitive Processes. I am Dr. Ark Verma from IIT Kanpur. We have been talking about memory uh, in the last few lectures and in the last lecture we talked about encoding and we specifically talked about what are the different processes uh, by which you can encode information to your long term memory. Uh, we talked about a variety of encoding processes and we showed through the use of these different experiments that how uh, these different encoding uh, you know processes, the different kinds of encoding procedures can have an impact on your retrieval, how good or how bad your retrieval of that uh, you know uh, content will be later. Uh, in today's lecture, we will talk a little bit in more detail about retrieval and we will also talk about uh, you know this mental function of memory is realized in the brain. You would have noticed that in, a, in one of the earlier lectures also we have been talking uh, by and uh, by about how different uh, areas of the brain are involved in uh, memory, but uh, we will try and do a more detailed analysis of that relationship. Now, let us talk about what retrieval is. So, retrieval is basically when you are trying to bring back information from your memory in order to uh, you know use it or in order to describe it to somebody and so on and so forth. One of the important aspects in retrieval is if you are presented with information that can help you retrieve that uh, any uh, you know content uh, more easily or seamlessly. So, retrieval cues uh, become very handy then. What are retrieval cues? Retrieval cues are words or other stimuli that help us remember information that is stored in our memory. Say for example, uh, there is this uh, you know excerpt I have taken from Goldstein uh, and it describes a child's going back to a place where he had uh, spent uh, some of uh, some of his childhoods at his grandparents house. And what he does is I've, uh, this, go, uh, this child goes to that grand, uh, the grandparents house and kind of is moving around the house there are so many things in the house that will remind him of ex episodes and things that he experienced while he was let us say 8 years old, 10 years old and was uh, spending this holidays in that particular house. Now, each of these uh, stimuli, each of these stimuli or say for example, if there are words uh, uh, written or something like that at that place uh, will act as cues of retrieval of that information that has uh, been uh, you know long past and uh, apparently forgotten till this particular moment. You might also recall say for example, you know in your own experience if you meet somebody uh, you know who you have not seen for 10 years or 5 years or 15 years maybe, uh, just the sight of that person reminds you of the kind of experiences you have had together of the kind of uh, you know conversations you might have shared with each other and everything around that era kind of gets relived in just a flashback. So, this is basically what retrieval cues are. Now, uh, there are also different recall methods which might basically affect how well or how uh, uh, poorly uh, you will recall particular kinds of information. So, I will just describe uh, uh, two kinds of recall methods to you. So, free recall is basically when a participant is simply asked to recall a stimulus. So, if a participant has just said that whatever you learn in class today and the child has come home and maybe one of the uh, parents is just asking, uh, repeat to me whatever you have learned in the class. Now, you are not giving any cues, you are just asking this child to repeat straight out of his memory whatever uh, you know about a particular subject that he or she might have learned in the school. So, these uh, you know uh, things uh, these kind of stimuli that you can ask uh, you know the participant to use free recall with uh, could be about previously uh, uh, presented events or experience uh, that have happened in the participant's life something like whatever he had uh, experiences he had in the school. Cued recall uh, could be when the participant is already presented with retrieval cues to aid in recall of the previously experienced stimuli. Say for example, if you if uh, one of the parents is uh, uh, you know taking up a book and he's saying uh, which pages did you cover in the class today, and then from that uh, you know uh, from the number of pages that the child points out, the parent is reading out some sentences and asking uh, whether you learned about this and what did you learn about this particular topic. This will basically be uh, an example of cued recall. So, you are giving the child some cues as to recall that information and in that sense uh, you know you are giving him in some sense some help uh, you know to recall uh, that information from. Now, 
A uh, experimental uh, demonstration of the same could be found in Tulwing and Pearlstone's experiment in 1966. So, what they did was in an experiment they presented participants with a list of words to remember and these list of words were drawn from specific categories. The kind of recall they would ask these participants to undergo would could be either a free recall or a cued recall. So, the list of uh, words will be presented and the memory test instruction will be just recall whatever list of words were repeated to you. In a second condition or with the second group which is the queued recall group, you present the list of words in the acquisition phase and then you tell them to recall all the furnitures that uh, you know all the furniture names that you heard or let us say all the uh, bird names that you heard. Now, what are you doing here? You are basically giving them a category and they can now fill up those categories with whatever words from the list they remember that fall into this category. What happened as the result, you can already see that the percentage of words recalled is much better in case of queued recall as compared to in a free recall. So, the results of uh, this particular experiment, Tulwing and Pearlstone's experiment demonstrated that retrieval cues do aid memory. Participants in the uh, free recall uh, group perform much worse than the participants in the queued recall group. In another experiment, Mantilla 1986 uh, presented his participants with a list of uh, 600 nouns such as banana, freedom, tree and so on and so forth. Now, during the learning phase, the participants were told to write down three words they could associate with each noun. So, that was done. Uh, for example, for a banana, they could uh, write say for example, it is yellow in color, punches are made out of it and it is edible. So, any, uh, any uh, you know, three words that the participant could generate themselves. When the participants took a surprise memory test in which they were presented with three words they had created and asked to reproduce the original word, they would remember are up to 90% uh, of the 600 words that they were uh, made to learn. So, here you can see the results. If they were uh, you know given cues that they had presented themselves, their recall was around 90%. If during learning they saw the banana and the cues created by somebody else were given, so somebody else kind of tries to give cues, then the performance is uh, slightly worse, but it is very good. Uh, but if uh, you know there is uh, no uh, cue provided, then their performance of recall is much lower, it is even less than 20 percent. So, uh, you see that queued uh, recall uh, kind of helps participant retrieve information better, information learned could be information could be uh, learned to the almost the same extent, but you do not have a proper retrieval queue uh, to bring it out. Let us uh, talk about some of the conditions wherein you can have good uh, retrieval uh, scenarios. So one of the aspects of uh, when you are matching uh, encoding and retrieval is this concept of encoding specificity. Now, encoding specificity is basically when you are uh, encoding or learning new information given a particular setting, if you kind of revisit that setting, that information becomes easily available to you and that information becomes more easily retrievable. If you remember the uh, you know uh, the child going to the grandparents house example, given that the child was going through this house after 10, 15, 20 years and the child was interacting with objects that have been in the house since that time, all of those objects are acting as retrieval cues uh, for uh, uh, you know uh, the memories of that time, but that entire setting, that entire presence in say for example, one of the rooms where the child would have lived or played, that entire setting uh, basically makes this available because the information was encoded or learned or the experience had been gone through in that room. So, that is basically an example of what encoding, encoding specificity could be like. Godin and Badley in 1975, they conducted what is called a diving experiment, wherein one group of participants put on a diving equipment and studied a list of words while they were underwater and another group of participants studied a list of words when they were on land. They were later tested for, both of the groups were tested for this list of words and the results showed that the best recall occurred when the encoding and the test conditions were matching. So, I will show you the results right here. So, you can see at the extreme left and the extreme right, uh, both the parts, uh, the encoding uh, and uh, retrieval conditions are matched and the performance is maximal. Another simple example of encoding specificity or a similar example to encoding specificity could be state dependent learning. Now, state dependent learning is basically about that information that is learned in a particular internal state such as a mood 
or a state of awareness. Say for example, if you are excited or happy or even angry and you are saying some things and some information is being told to you versus if you are in a awake uh, state of awareness or you are slightly drowsy or if you are under the influence of some uh, you know drugs or something. Uh, information that you kind of are gaining under those states of awareness or under that under the influence of that particular mood will be very readily available to you once uh, you are in that same mood again. So, According to this principle, memory will be better when a person's internal state during the encoding part, um, during the retrieval part matches his or her internal state during encoding of that information. So, for example, each and Mitkaf basically they did this test, they demonstrated that person's memory is better uh, when a person's mood uh, during retrieval matches his mood during the encoding part. So, they basically asked participants to think positive thoughts while listening to merry music or depressing thoughts while listening to melancholic music and then uh, the participants were later asked to rate their mood. So, as very pleasant up to very unpleasant. Once this has occurred, uh, they were asked to study lists of words about positive or negative. So, once mood was established, they were asked to uh, memorize this list of words which were about uh, while they were still in their positive or negative mood. After this study session ended, the participants were told to return after two days. Two days later, when the participants returned, the same procedure was followed to induce the same mood. So, now what is happening is they are probably in the same mood as in when they had learned that information. The results showed that they did much better when their mood at recall was matching their mood at uh, you know when the encoding was happening. Here you can see again in the extreme right and the extreme left you can see when the uh, encoding mood and the retrieval mood matches the performance is better when the encoding mode and the retrieval uh, mode uh, does not match the performance is slightly lowered. Another aspect again of encoding specificity or a similar example could be transfer appropriate processing. Now, transfer appropriate processing is basically that memory uh, performance is enhanced if the type of task at encoding matches the type of task at retrieval. So, if you are doing something say for example, uh, trans uh, an example of transfer appropriate uh, processing uh, could be say for example, uh, if you are doing the same thing uh, while uh, you know you are learning something and you are doing the same uh, thing while you are uh, retrieving. So, I will give you an example Morris and co-workers in 1977 they did an experiment with two parts the encoding part of the experiment had two conditions first was the meaning condition second was the rhyming condition. In the meaning condition they had to focus on the meaning of the word in the rhyming condition they had to focus on the sound of the word. So, and demonstration uh, could be uh, something like this here you can see. So, the sentence is this uh, blank had a silver Indian. So, what they have to do is let us come back to this uh, participants in the both conditions during the test part they heard a sentence with one word replaced by blank and two seconds later they heard a target word. The task for the memory group was to answer yes or no based on the meaning of the word. The task of the rhyming group was to answer yes or no based on the uh, sound of the word. Now, you see what the task is. So, from the meaning condition the sentence is the blank had a silver engine, the target word is train. So, now the person has to answer whether the meaning of the word train matches that blank. Similarly, uh, the blank walked down the street now the and the target word is building participant has to uh, on the meaning of the word building decide whether it can fit in that blank or not. Okay. This is the meaning part. The second part is the rhyming condition. So, blank rhymes with pain the participant and the target word is let us say train and the participant has to say uh, yes train rhymes with pain or uh, maybe uh, if there is another word it does not. The second word is the blank rhymes with car and the target word is building. So, now he has to say because building does not rhyme with car he has to say no. So, what you are seeing is in these two conditions the participant is doing something related to meaning. In the second condition the participant is doing something related to rhyme of these different words. Now, in the retrieval part of the experiment this was the encoding part. In the retrieval part of the experiment participants of both the groups were given a rhyming recognition test. So, for the test participants were presented with 32 words that rhymed with one of the target words during encoding and 32 words that did not rhyme. So, the list contained of 62 words 32 rhymed with the target words 30, uh, and one did not uh, and uh, the other 32 did not. The rhyming words presented in this test because it is a new case is always different from the rhyming words were presented during the target uh, you know which were presented earlier. 
So, participant's task was to indicate whether each word presented during retrieval rhymed with one of the targets that they had seen uh, that they had heard during learning. The results showed that the participants who were in the rhyming group during encoding remembered uh, more uh, words than the participants who were in the meaning group. So, encoding uh, uh, during meaning task and retrieval in the rhyming condition was uh, much uh, poorer, encoding during rhyming task and uh, retrieval during rhyming task was much uh, better. Now, coming to memory and the brain. Donald Hebb in 1948 introduced the idea that learning and memory are represented in the brain by physiological changes that, takes pla that take place during a synapse. Now, if you remember the chapter we did on brain and behavior, you might want to recall all of that uh, for uh, you know getting these concepts now. Now, let us assume that a particular experience that when a particular experience happens, uh, neuron A uh, fires and it causes uh, you know sends an impulse to neuron B and then the neuron B as well fires. So, Hebb's idea was that this activity strengthens the synapse by causing structural changes, greater neurotransmitter release and increased firing. Uh, Hebb also proposed that changes occurs in hundreds and thousands of synapses that are activated by a particular experience. Say for example, if you are learning uh, a particular skill, if you are learning let us say sword fighting for the first time, there are constantly uh, a lot of changes that are going on in your brain with kind, because you are uh, learning a completely different motor activity. Now, these proposals became the starting point for modern uh, research uh, of uh, memory and its physiology. See, for example, here you can see that uh, you know what is happening at a synapse and they are kind of trying to record this uh, using some a technique called single uh, cell recording. I will elaborate about this uh, in, in a while. Now, one outcome of these changes which Hebb is proposing happening at the synaptic level is called long term potentiation. What is long term potentiation is basically enhanced firing of neurons after repeated stimulation. Say for example, if you are learning one skill again and again and you are practicing again and again, there is uh, the neurons that fired in the first instance of learning that skill will fire again and again on the second, third, tenth and fifteenth instances of the same skill and in that sense they will uh, basically learn that skill. So, in that sense your learning of that skill is being encoded at the neuronal level. So, LTP basically uh, you know shows that repeated stimulation not only causes structural changes, but it also leads to enhanced responding. Now, if and I think this question a lot of people uh, would have asked uh, many a times that where does memory uh, you know occur in the brain? Is it uh, one part of the brain that all the memory for everything sits or is it say for example, uh, the entire brain that the memory sits? How is it uh, actually done? Now, let me tell you that memory does not really occur in a specific site in the brain or a specific place in the brain. It is distributed across a range of different areas. The frontal cortex is important for memory while for other uh, areas uh, like the medial temporal lobe uh, can also be said to be important for uh, memory. Uh, here you can see the perirhinal cortex, the parahippocampal cortex, the enterhinal cortex, the hippocampus and the amygdala are some of the structures which are considered very important uh, as far as memory is concerned. The medial temporal lobe houses the hippocampus, it also houses what is called the perirhinal cortex. Now, Davashi and co-workers in 2003, they designed a study to determine how, how do these areas respond to name of the objects presented as part of a memory experiment. So, participants were uh, shown around 200 words while they were in an fMRI scanner and they were instructed to create an image of a specific place that went along with each of these words. See for example, if you hear the word dirty, you can imagine uh, say for example, a garbage dump or maybe a railway platform. Now, 20 hours later, uh, the participants were presented uh, you know a recognition test uh, in which they had the same 200 words that they had learned during the uh, earlier phase and with some two uh, you know around 200 new words during this part of the experiment they were not in the uh, scanner so the first uh, testing phase was now out of the scanner and they were to in uh, basically talk about which of the words they had seen before so a correct answer would be old uh, when the, the word presented was already seen earlier and uh, new when the pre word was not presented earlier. Davachi found that uh, participants remembered 54 percent of the older words and forgot the rest 46 percent of the words. 
These results basically indicated that activity in the perirhinal cortex uh, was greater for remembered words than for forgotten words. And so, it could be uh, concluded that the perirhinal cortex, uh, you know, in the perirhinal cortex, the words that generated more activity during encoding were likely to be familiar uh, to the participants during the recognition test. So, what basically they found is those words that were old generated more activity in the perirhinal cortex, those words that were new generated less activity in the perirhinal cortex. So, it kind of tells you that the perirhinal cortex is that area of the brain which kind of codes for familiarity, which kind of kind will tell you that this is some stimulus I have interacted with earlier. Uh, this is the setup of uh, Davachi and colleagues study. The participant is uh, in the you know uh, fMRI scanner and is imagining a place uh, associated with this word. So here in uh, you can see the result. Other structures in the medial temporal lobe are also involved in memory. For example, the uh, parahippocampal area is important for remembering spatial information, and the entorhinal cortex is responsible for uh, use in recognition memory. Now let us talk about memory consolidation. Every time you retrieve some information, you kind of need to uh, consolidate that memory as well. So, consolidation refers to the process that transforms the newly formed fragile memories uh, to more uh, stable and permanent state where they are more resistant to disruption or change. So, if you are going through a particular experience, uh, that memory will be formed, but it needs to be consolidated before it kind of goes to a more uh, stable and a more permanent uh, stage. Now, this process involves reorganization in the nervous system, which kind of occurs at two levels. Synaptic consolidation, which occurs at the synapse level and happens rapidly over a period of minutes, whatever structural changes are going on in the neurons with respect to that experience you are having. Second is systems consolidation, which basically involves a gradual reorganization of the circuits within the brain regions and basically takes place over a much longer time scale. So, it is kind of happening more gradually and uh, kind of leads to better, uh, you know, uh, organization of that entire circuit. Early research inspired by Hebb's pioneering work on the role of synapse in memory focused on synaptic consolidation. So, early research is more about synaptic consolidation. More recent, uh, recent research has now focused on the phenomena of systems consolidation and the role of different brain areas uh, or the entire networks in the brain areas and uh, how they uh, contribute to forming memories. So, hippocampus uh, plays a central role in the standard model of consolidation. Let me talk to you about what the standard model of consolidation is. There are two theories. The first is the standard model of consolidation and basically the point is the graded property of retrograde amnesia in which amnesia is worse for experiences that have occurred just prior to brain injury plus other evidence have kind of led to this model. So, the model kind of proposes that memory retrieval depends on hippocampus during consolidation, but once the consolidation is complete, it does not uh, in any longer require the hippocampus. So, incoming information uh, is supposed to activate a number of areas in the cortex. Activation is distributed across the cortex because memory typically involves so many sensory areas getting activated and other cognitive areas in which you are thinking and deciding about these things. So, this is because the memory for event and things may involve a lot of activity. Uh, the hippocampus is kind of the area is going to coordinate this activity of these different uh, cortical areas. So, there will be cortical areas uh, related to the sensory in information about this experience. There might be cortical areas activated which have to do with the higher co uh, cognitive process like thinking, deciding and those kind of things. Hippocampus is the area which will coordinate this activity in this uh, network of areas. The major mechanism of uh, consolidation is called reactivation, a process in which the hippocampus is replaying this neural activity associated with a particular experience or memory. During reactivation, activity occurs in the entire network connecting the hippocampus and the cortex. So, uh, this activity uh, leads into the formation of connection between these cortical areas, the major areas of the brain. Remember, we are not talking about synaptic level uh, connections here. This reactivation process occurs during sleep uh, or during uh, periods of relaxed wakefulness and can also be uh, enhanced, uh, you know, by conscious rehearsing of a memory. So, if you have learned something, if you have learned some material, it might be a good idea to at some point, you know, in a relaxed state, try and remember what all you learned during the class. So, what you might be doing is probably, you know, doing some kind of a systems consolidation, wherein you are rehearsing this entire thing. 
Eventually, the cortical connections become strong enough so that the different sites in the cortex become directly linked and the hippocampus is no longer necessary. So, after the consolidation is done, memory is uh, you know placed and is in a distributed fashion across the brain, you do not need the hippocampus again to bring out that memory. So, according to the standard model of consolidation, the hippocampus is strongly active during uh, when the memories are first formed, but much less active when the memories are consolidated until eventually only cortical activity is necessary to retrieve these remote memories. Uh, this is kind of uh, you know a representation of how over time these net cortical networks might get strengthened uh, with respect to uh, you know newer memories. The other model is the uh, multiple trace hypothesis. According to the multiple trace hypothesis, the hippocampus is involved in retrieval of remote memories and especially episodic memories. Evidence for this idea comes from experiments like the one by Giboa and co-workers who elicited recent and re, uh, remote episodic memories by showing participants photographs of when they were 5 years uh, old uh, till uh, very recent photographs. The result of this experiment showed that the hippocampus was active during both uh, recent memories and remote memories. Now, the fact that there is evidence uh, supporting both uh, the involvement of hippocampus in both recent memories and remote memories, it has led to a lot of discussion among memory researchers uh, as to whether or not hippocampus is involved during the retrieval of remote memories. Now, uh, interesting concept of after consolidation is the concept of reconsolidation. Now, Nader and researchers have worked in this area and they propose that once a memory is reactivated, it must undergo what is called a reconsolidation, which is a similar process to consolidation that occurred after the initial learning. But this happens much more rapidly. So, one can say that memory becomes susceptible to being changed or disrupted every time it is received, every time it is retrieved, every time you kind of remember something again, it might be you know uh, susceptible or amenable to change or manipulation. So, reconsolidation might provide an opportunity for reinforcing or even updating new memories. For example, an animal that returns to a location of a food source and finds that the food has been moved to a different place uh, can kind of uh, you know uh, benefit with reconsolidation. He will update the new memory with the fact that now the food is not here, it is probably uh, moved to uh, you know location B. So, this updation will happen and the updated memory will be reconsolidated. A good experiment was done by Nader and colleagues. They used classical conditioning to create a fear response uh, of freezing uh, to presentation of a tone. So, they uh, did uh, is they present they paired a tone and an electric shock for a rat and then what they did was they injected the rat with anisomycin. Now, anisomycin is an antibiotic that inhibits protein synthesis and prevents uh, formation or consolidation of memories. Now, an important aspect of this experiment was around the timing of uh, you know when the injection of anisomycin is given. In condition 1, the rat received the pairing of the tone and the shock on day 1 and received the anisomycin on day 2. On day 3, it was uh, checked, it was uh, played, the tone was played and it was checked that the rat did you know freeze to the tone. This is expected because conditioning already happened on day 1 and anisomycin was not injected until day 2. In condition 2, the rat receives a pairing of the tone on uh, uh, tone in shock on day 1 and is immediately uh, injected with anisomycin. On day 3, when the rat is tested with the tone, it does not freeze because that uh, connection between tone and shock was not formed as anisomycin was injected immediately. In day 3, what happens? The memory becomes reactivated and becomes more fragile just as it was immediately being formed. So, what was happening is uh, you kind of play the tone, the rat uh, you know, is uh, getting into the freezing behavior and then you uh, place uh, freezing, uh, inject anisomycin and then uh, you see that the rat still freezes on day 3 because the activity, uh, because the memory was uh, re uh, not reconsolidated. Does this occur in humans as well? So, Nader basically in an experiment, uh, you know, Nader thought that it does and in an experiment by Hubback and colleagues in 2007, it was shown, uh, you know, that it actually happens with humans as well. So, this experiment was very simple. Uh, a group of participants learned a list of words on day 1, on day 2, the other group. Uh, so, there are two groups, a reminder group and non-reminder group. On day 2, one of the groups learned the new list of words and the another group, that is the reminder group, learned the same list of words. When on day 3, these two groups were asked to remember the list 1, the no reminder group recalled around 45 percent of the words from list 1, but mistakenly remembered 5 percent of the words from list 2. The reminder group recalled 36 percent of the words from list 1, but mistakenly they kind of remembered around 40, uh, 24 percent of uh, the words from list 2. 
Now, according to Hubback and colleagues, what happened was that uh, the reminder on day 2 reactivated the memory for list 1 and it became vulnerable to change. And in that sense, the, uh, some of the words from list 2 uh, kind of uh, you know uh, got mixed up with the words from list 1 and that is why they are mistakenly remembering more words from uh, list uh, 2 while they are being asked to recall list 1 as well. A practical implication or outcome of research on uh, reconsolidation is a possible treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. So, a clinical psychologist Alain Burnett tested the idea that reactivation of memory uh, followed by reconsolidation can provide a way to alleviate uh, symptoms of what is called the post-traumatic stress disorder. This basically involves you know having a flashback of the traumatic event again and again. The idea was to reactivate a person's memory for the traumatic event and then inject probenolol, basically a drug which kind of blocks the production of a stress hormone in the amygdala. So, what is happening is that uh, he had two groups of PTSD patients, both of them listened to a 30 second recording of themselves describing the, their traumatic experiences and while they are kind of relieving this experience, they received probenolol injection while the other uh, group uh, just received a placebo. It was found one week later when both groups were told to imagine their traumatic experience again. Uh, again listening to this 30 second recording, it is found uh, you know and then uh, you know uh, to determine their reaction to the imagining this experience, uh, skin conducting response and blood pressure were being monitored. It was found that the probenolol group experienced much smaller increases in their heart rate and skin conductance than the placebo group. This showed that the reactivation of memory and uh, the absence of reconsolidation and uh, the presence of reconsolidation uh, basically led to you know significant decrease in the symptoms of PTSD even months after this particular treatment. So, you have talked about uh, retrieval uh, and uh, you know how the brain uh, kind of uh, participates in memory in this lecture uh, and I hope uh, this uh, whole point was clear to you and we will talk about uh, other aspects of memory in the next lecture.